He wants me to follow that. I don't know what to do. You may be seated. I love the Lord, and I thank him for all of his blessings. I thank him for his mercy, and I thank him for his grace and everything he's given to me. God's been good to me, amen? amen. He's been good to each and every one of us. More than we know, more than we realize. There's times that some of you under the sound of my voice have cried out unto the Lord all by yourself when nobody knew what was going on. But he was there. Amen. He was there. He heard you. He knew what was going on. He loves you. I said he loves you. He loves us so much. I'm going to read tonight from Matthew chapter 10. One verse of scripture. You stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. Matthew 10, number 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power. Can you say power? power? Against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Lord Jesus, we come before you this night, Lord, and we're asking... God, that you anoint these lips of clay, Lord Jesus. Anoint these hearts to hear your word. God, there's nothing I can do or nothing I can say, Lord, but you. You alone, O oh Lord Jesus, can touch this people, can touch the hearts of these people, O oh Lord, I pray. God, I give them to you, Lord, and I'm asking that you help me, God, this night to do what you would have me to do. And I'll give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. In Acts chapter 9, you can read of a man named Saul. A man named Saul, he was a very learned man, a very smart man. We've heard Brother G.L. talk about it a whole lot. He was a very, very smart man. Brother Petey sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the, one of the leading men of that day. Smart man. I remember in history learning about, I called him Socrates, but Socrates. You learn about Socrates and Plato and all the Greek philosophers and how they would go and sit beside these people. And listen to them expound and speak day in and day out because they had the knowledge. They were the smart people of the day. They were the people that had all of the smarts. And people would sit and listen to them. Well, you see, Paul was one of them people. He was a very smart man. He was a very wise man. He had a lot of knowledge. But you see, there was one thing Paul lacked was the power. Paul had no power because Paul had the truth. He had the word. He, he had what he thought he knew. But he had no power. You see, Paul, he was going to do a little job. He was going to take some letters and go to Damascus. And as he went out into Damascus, the Bible says that a great light shone round about him. And that light shined upon him, and it blinded him. And from that light, he began to speak. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecute. Jesus. You see, at that very minute, he realized, I believe with all of my heart, that Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. Right then. You see, the, the, the Jews was a monotheistic people. They believed in one God. Hear, O Israel, the, na the Lord our God is one Lord. They believed in one God. So when Jesus spoke to him, he knew, Brother David, at that very time that that was God speaking to him. He realized that he was speaking with the Messiah that had came and give his life for that people. He realized that at that very moment. And as he stood there on that road blinded and all the people that was around him, Brother David, it said that they were scared because they heard a voice, but they saw no man. They were scared to death. A lot of us are just like Paul. We walk around day in and day out. We think we're right. You think you do things right. You think you have the right attitude. I mean, we've been hearing message upon message from Brother GL these past few weeks, and they've done something to me. A second look at your sacrifice. Wow. I looked at that and I began to think about those things. I believe, man, what are we really giving the Lord? Lord, what are you trying to tell us? Is there something within us that's not exactly what it should be? And I begin to think about Paul. Paul had all the wisdom. He had all the smarts. But Paul was lacking. You see, you can have all the wisdom. And you can have all the smarts. You can do the best dance. 
You can sing the best. You can be the best drummer, the best, best piano player. But without the power of God in your life, you're nothing. Without God in your life, you are nothing. We can all be just like Paul. We can walk on this, this road we call life at the crossroad. We stand there. So many of us do it. So many of us walk there during our life, and we stand there, and we don't know which way to go. Do we go left, Lord, or do we go right? What do I do, God? How many of y'all have ever been there? Scared to death. You know not what to do, but God is there. You see, it takes a revelation of the power of God to open your eyes, to open your understanding. I remember one of the, one of the funniest things, my grandmother, God bless her, she, she used to look at us kids, and I'd walk in there in the house. I'd say, Grandma, she said, she called me every one of the grandkids but my name, Todd, Derek, Daryl, Tom, Sue. She couldn't remember my name for nothing, and finally she'd get it. You see, there's a lot of times in our life we do the same thing. We, we, we allow things in our life we, we can't remember because we're, we're so fuzzy. We're, fu- we're so bumfuzzled with the things that's going on around us. We come into church and we carry such a load on us. We carry such a burden that as the songs begin to go, as the word begins to go forth, we sit there and we think on things that we shouldn't be thinking on. We, we think on things that are running through our mind about, Brother Gio, what am I going to do for a job? What am I going to do for this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that, Brother Robbie? Each and every one of us have our own troubles. We have our own trials. We have our own struggles. But it's the same way. We're all human beings. We all have things that we, that we struggle against. You see, but when you finally get a revelation of who God really is, just like Paul did, when you finally get that revelation and begin to understand that this is God, that there's nothing I can do without him. I can't even walk, the song says. I can't even talk without him. I, in him I live and I move and I have my being. He is the reason that I am. Amen. He is the reason that I am here tonight. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can say that makes me worthy enough to be here. But God, who is rich in glory. But God is the reason I'm here tonight. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 said, we would receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon us. What is power, Brother David? I've asked that a lot. God, what is the power? The power heals people. The power does this. Well, Jesus said in Luke 4, 18 and 19, He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal, Brother Robbie, the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty to them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's it in a nutshell. The power will help you. The power will anoint you, Brother Pete. The power will help you help somebody else. It's not just to give you the glory bumps every time you come to church and to, and to shout a little bit. That ain't what he gave it to us for. He gave it to us to go out there and do what he called us to do. Amen. To go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that his house may be full. There's an old song I know a lot of you know. It says, my house is full, but my fields are empty. Who is going to work for me today? So many times I think of that. We was here the other night. Uh, cleaning the church and doing some things and I'm sitting here looking at all these seats and I thought God it's your will that these every one of these seats be full but it's not your will that that stops there it's not his will that every one of these seats are full and then that's it God we got a full church thank you that ain't his will his will brother Robbie is that the next town has a church full and the next town has a church full and the next town has a church full till everybody hears the gospel of the Holy Ghost You see, Paul received his revelation, and it changed his life. And with his life changed, he began to preach. And he began to witness to all those he come in contact with. The very people he once persecuted, they were scared to death of him when he began to knock on the door to get help. They were scared. But those people brought him in and began to teach him and began to love him. You see, that's what happens when when God comes on the scene. The very people that you might hate, The very people that might hate you, when God takes all of that away, you will love them. 
you will care for them. And as Brother Gio said this morning, I thought of it, I said, wow, Lord, you even feel sorry for them. Because you begin to look at them and say, God, there, but by your grace and mercy goes I. There, but by your mercy and grace is me, Lord. There's so many people in this world that we look at them and we condemn them and you look and say, I'd never do that. Without the grace of God in your life, you are capable of doing or becoming anything. It's the mercy and the grace of God that is upon us that keeps us and, 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 and blesses us and looks over us. You see, we read of an account of Paul's preaching in Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. It says, and God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. So that from his body were brought unto him the sick handkerchiefs, or unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases parted from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Brother Robbie, they took parts of his clothes, they took handkerchiefs that he had, anything that they had, Brother David, they would take it off of Paul and they would lay it upon people that were sick. Why? It was the power of the Lord, and it was the faith to believe. You see, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without the faith, we're nothing. That's why when I pray, I say, Lord, don't let my faith fail. When I pray for somebody else, God, don't let their faith fail. If Jesus himself prayed it, I might ought to take a look at that. Why did he pray that? He prayed that for a reason, because once our faith fails... We begin to look back. We begin to question, why do I even do this in the first place? Why do I get up? I might as well just give up. God, this really ain't worth it. I sit up there a while ago and I begin to think about that. God, so many people begin to question in their mind, this, this really ain't worth it, Brother Pete. It's really not worth it, but it is worth it. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm standing here to tell you, it's worth it. There's nothing out there for you. And I mean that. There's nothing in this world for you. Acts chapter 19, 13, and 16 says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them, saying, or took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord, Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, a chief of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And I'm going to stop right there for a minute. We all know what happened later. But Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And I sit here the other night when Brother Gio read that same scripture, and a thought popped into my head. And I couldn't shake it. And it's, it's been with me for a week now. And I've been thinking, Lord, what is this? Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? You see, the devil could care less who you are. You hear what I'm saying? The devil could care less who you are until the Spirit of the Lord is in you. You hear what I'm saying? He don't care how many drugs you do. He don't care how much you drink, how much you smoke, how much you cuss, whatever you do. He don't care. But as soon as you surrender your life to the will of the Lord, He begins to look. And He begins to think, oh, oh, wait a minute. He said, I got to look at this one. Something is stirring within Him. As you begin to read the Word of the Lord and you begin to fall upon your face and cry out unto the name of the Lord, he begins to have an ear. He begins to listen. You see, he begins to care. He begins to think, oh, my Lord, what am I going to do now? I'm losing another one. I don't know what to do. I know this. Brother G.L., when I, when I begin to think in my mind, I begin to drive. I'm coming to work. I've told this a lot. But I, as I'm driving to work, I begin to think about things. I begin to think about, and this is when I wouldn't come to church, I would think about songs that people sang. And I'd see the faces 
of ladies that went to church with me, Brother Billy, old ladies that would cry out unto the Lord, that would worship the Lord, saints of God, and I would look at them, and I would begin to cry. And I'd be like, Lord, I don't know what to do. I did know what to do, but, but I was scared because it was a pride thing. See, pride's a bad thing. I'm here to tell you, pride will kill you. Pride will destroy you because pride will make you do things that you think you wouldn't do. You will not do things that you know you need to do because of your pride. And as I sit there in that car driving, I begin to see these faces of these little old women. One of them was Sister Walker. She would sing a song, I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day. Oh, she sang across the bridge. There's no more sorrow. And I would hear these songs, Brother Robbie. Across the bridge, there's no more sorrow. And I'd think, and I'd sit there, and tears would run down my face, and I said, Lord, help me. But you know what? It's easy to say, help me. It's easy to call upon the Lord, but it's hard to drop everything and follow him. You see, when he walked to Peter and him at the nets, he said, hey, buddy, what's going on? He said, nothing. He said, well, you're a fisherman. Why don't you just drop what you got and come and follow me? That's what they did. That's what you got to do. That's what we all got to do. That's what I've been getting from hearing our pastor preach in our sacrifices and changing some of the things we're doing is letting go of some of the things that we think are the most important, Sister Rita, and cleaving to the things that the Lord would have us to do. You see, the devil, like I said a while ago, he cares let, for less who you are until the Lord is within you. He cares nothing about you until the Lord was, is within you. The old song says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. I am reminded of the devil. He comes before the Lord, and he's sitting there talking to him, and the Lord said, Hey, bud. Have you considered my servant Job? And when I read that scripture, I think, wow. You know the devil bullet? He can't touch you unless God allows him to. You see, if I'm living the way that I'm supposed to live, the devil will answer the same way he did back then. Well, God, I can't touch him. You got a hedge around him. So all the times that I look at myself and I say, God, look what I'm going through. He's just reminding me that I got a hedge around you. Just raise your head up. Look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Don't, don't grovel in all the things you think's bad because it could be worse. There could be things worse. Look in the mirror. Look at other people that you come in contact with. This whole world is in, a, is in a fix, as they say, Brother Robbie. But there's a whole lot worse off than we are. And you know what? With the Spirit of God within us, we can overcome any situation. We can overcome any circumstance. Because with God, all things are possible. Amen? There's nothing I can do on my own. But with Him, all things are possible. And I thank Him for that. You see, is the devil stood before Job, but stood before the Lord, and he told him, "Have you considered my servant Job?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, I have." But you got this hedge around him, brother, brother Terry. He said, "If you just take that hedge off just for a little bit, just let just let me touch his family, he'll curse you and die." The Lord said, "Okay, but you can't kill him." He touched his family. Well, he didn't curse him. He said, well, if you just let me touch his body. Come on, somebody. There's some people in this place today that feel like giving up, that feel like God is so far from them. But he's here, and he loves you. I look at a lot of people that I used to work with, and, and a lot of things have been happening, Brother Gio, a lot of things that, that, that weigh heavy on my heart. A lot of people have given up, literally. And they, they think that there's only one way out. And they end their life. 
without knowing that there is a God that loves them. You see, the devil, he could care less, as I said a while ago, who each and every one of us are. But Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. The devil could care less who I am. He don't even know my name. But yet, my creator knew me before I even was. He could care less who I am until the Spirit of the Lord is up in, within me because I am no damage to Him. But when the Lord is within me and upon me, then He cares. But the Lord our God knew us before we were created. My, my, my. Genesis 5 and 1 tells us that we were created in His likeness, in His image. My, my, my. Lord. I want you all to just to listen to this. This is a, a lengthy part of Scripture here, but as I was reading it today, I, I said, Lord, let me know how much you really love me. And it kept going through my mind. He don't care for you, but I love you. He could care less for you, but I love you. Somebody needs to know that Jesus loves them in this place. Hear me. Somebody needs to know that Jesus loves you in this place today. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I free, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. And here it is. For thou hast possessed my reins. And thou hast covered me in thy mother's womb. And I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. My Lord. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. As I said a while ago, the devil, he care less about you. He don't care who you are. He don't care what you look like. He don't care what you sound like. But when you give your heart to the Lord, he cares about you. We are, you know the reason he does that? 
because we are God's prize creation. Brother McKinney, we are the, the, the apple of his eye, so to speak. We are the very thing that he loves the most. He created us in his very image. He allowed us to be who we are. Had a lot of people say, if God is so good, why does he let things happen to good people? Why does he let these things happen to these little babies and all this stuff? And I told them simply, you know, Brother Terry, if he stepped in, then we've lost our freedom of choice. If he done one thing, then you don't have a choice anymore. And when you stand before him one day, Brother Robbie, it's going to be you made the choice to call upon him when you were able to. Because the word tells me that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One of these days we will all stand before him and we will see him as he is and we will know him as he is. And the old song says, I want to do it right now. I want to do it right now, Brother Billy, while I have the chance, while I'm able to. God, I want to kneel before you and call upon your name. I want to worship you and I want to praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You love me, Lord, no matter what I go through, no matter what I face, you are there. When I was all alone in the darkness, when I was driving by myself in the car, you were there. You see, and I lay in my bed, and I, and I think, and me and Brother David was talking so many times, I would write things down, even at work. People would say things, and a thought would come to my head, and I would write it down, and I didn't know what I was doing. I'd just write a scripture down or write a thought down. And then when you get home, begin to read your Bible or begin to put things together, Brother Gio, you know how it works. Everything begins to bam, bam, bam. And you're like, wow. Thoughts that don't even make sense to you, when you give them to the Lord, He begins to re reveal things unto you, and it helps people. So many times at work, people will be like, what are, you, what are you writing, Bo? And I begin to tell them. I begin to show them. And they would think that was just awesome. Well, well, and it would lead into, well, why do you do this? Or why do you do that? And so then I begin to tell them. This is the reason. But it all revolved back to the main point, and I wanted them to know that Jesus really loves you. You see, we get married and we, and we have a family because we desire something in our life. We all have a void in our heart. We all have a void in our life, and that void can only be filled by the power of God. So many people search for things in their life. They try drugs. They try whatever they can think of to do it, and they search for a longing. They search for something in their heart and their mind because they, they're, they're just not right, and they're reaching. And finally, when they think there's no hope, they give up. All without knowing. That still small voice that says, I'm here. I'm here. Come unto me, all you that are laboring, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. And he's standing. Just come on. Here I am. And when I sit in the church pew, me and Ashley went to church, and actually she started going first. Because I told God, I said, God, she ain't never going to go to church. It ain't happening. So I can't go back because she ain't never going to go. She don't believe what I believe. It ain't happening. And Brother David, she got up one day, and she said, I'm going to church. I was like, okay, where are you going? And she said, to your kind of church. And that done something to me because I sit there in the chair, and I wanted to cry. Brother Pete, because I was like, God, you know, you, you can't do this. You, you don't understand. This ain't the right time, God. You can't do this. But she said, I'm going to church. And she went to church. And she went for a while, and I wouldn't go with her. And then one day she came home, and she said, I'm never going back. And when she said that, it scared me to death. Because the thought come to my mind, you said she'd never go. 
And how she went, and you stopped her. It was all me. And I said, Lord, I got to do something. And then every day as I begin to drive, that's when all the snot bubbles and things begin to happen because I was scared. And people say, yeah, you had a mama praying. I did have a mama praying. But I was scared to death because I knew. And, and I had friend after friend tell me, oh, you're all right. You still know the truth. I said, knowing the truth and living the truth is two totally different things. You can know a lot of things. I know how to put gas in the car. But until I do it, that car ain't moving. Amen? And that's what I, tr I tried to explain to him. I said, I know a lot of stuff. But putting that stuff in action is what really gets me going where I need to go. And they said, oh, well, you ain't got to do this and you ain't got to do that. I said, I'd he rather get to heaven and find out I didn't have to do something than to stand before him and realize that I wished I would have done something. Amen. Because he made me the way I am. He gave me this life. It's up to me to do the best I can with it. All my little circle of influence, as I stood there and, and, and I began to talk to guys at work that I work with, and they looked at me and they said, what's wrong, Bo? Man, I probably still had red eyes from crying all the way to work. And they said, what's wrong, Bo? Nothing. Well, you ain't laughing. You ain't cutting up like you used to. What's wrong? But I was tore. And finally, one of my good friends, I looked at him and I said, I think I'm going to go back to church. He said, what? I said, I think I'm going to go back to church. And he said, that's good. I had one of them tell me, he said, I liked you better when you was going to church. I said, well, thank you. But he was actually an older man, and he didn't mean it funny, and he didn't mean it disrespectful, but he was telling me in his own way that he was watching me, and I never knew it. You see, so many times we, I remember being a young person, being in church when I was here, and then walking out and not doing exactly, Brother Robbie, what I know I should have been doing. And leaving the place and, and, and the witness that you are. People are watching you. And I'll never forget, I came home from my senior trip to Florida. And I got home and I was in the back of the church one night. And Brother Pollock at Lilburn, he was there. And he came back. We had some kind of fellowship. And as I was sitting there, he walked up to me, Brother Jill, and he was crying. And he handed me a piece of paper. And he said, this is for you. Somebody sent it to me. But I got sick to my stomach. My mouth got dry. I didn't know. I was like, oh, Lord. So I opened it up, and the letter read about how proud this woman, which was a teacher, was of me. And she began to tell how even though all these other kids were doing all this other stuff, on the senior trip, she said he was the most respectful. He tried his best to be the best he could. He lived exactly what he said he was on that senior trip. And then I started crying. Because, Sister Manning, that's what I wanted to do. My whole life, I've, I've not always done that. But you never realize the influence you have on people until you give up. You never realize who's watching you until you give up. And when you give up, Sister Judy, then you realize, and it's detrimental to you. And as I begin to think about me and Ashley, my children, my children, number one, because the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I looked at my babies, and I held them when they was all sleeping, all three of them, and I told God, I said, God, I know I ain't living right. I know I'm not where I need to be, but you give me each and every one of these babies. I said, God, and I'm asking somehow, some way, that you please use them for your kingdom. I remember pictures of my mama standing, holding me when I was a baby, giving me to the Lord. 
A lot of you, under the sound of my voice, your mothers, grandmothers held you and give you back to the Lord. We need to get back to that. Not just a physical act, but in prayer. Saying, God, use my family. Because if we don't pray for them, Brother Robbie, somebody out there is going to get them. And as I looked at my babies at night, I would cry. My wife would be asleep. I'd be walking the floor. I'd be looking at my children. And I, I begin to realize, my God, I love these babies more than I love myself. I love them so much. And then the thought, I loved you that much. And then I stood there in my bedroom. And tears began to run down my face. And I stood there and I began to realize, you know, that's right. Nothing I've done in these past 10 years has amounted to a hill of beans. But when I walked back down to that altar, I told Mama then when I come to church, I said, hey, don't mess with me. Don't nobody touch me. I don't want nobody doing all this. And don't touch me. I know the ropes. I got this. And I said, I'm going to do it when I feel like I need to. And as I stood there, I couldn't stand there no more. I held on to that pewter. I, I think I left fingerprints in it. My knuckles was white. But I said, God, you've been mighty good to me. And I ain't been too good to you. And I said, if you'll forgive me, I'll try my best to never let you down again. And I walked down to that altar, Brother David. And when my knees hit the floor, it was right, like right back on the wagon again. I said, thank you, Jesus. And all of the weight and all of the hurt and all of the pain and everything that I had been carrying for 10 years was gone just like that. And I'm here to tell you these last three, four years, they ain't been a bed of roses. But you see, when I kneel down in prayer, he's there. When I call upon him in my day of trouble, he's there. When I'm scared and I don't know what to do, Brother Bobby, and I say, God, help me, he's there. When the doctors say there's no hope, he's there. When you're all alone, laying in your bed at night, your husband don't know, your wife don't know, your friends don't know, he knows. All you have to do is give it all to him. There's a song that says, I will give you all. I will give you all. If all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. But if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, help me remember Calvary's cross and be willing to say yes. God, help me to never forget the price that you paid for me. Help me to never forget what you've done for me, the life that you lived for me, and all that you did that I might have life and have it more abundantly. And in closing tonight, I ask of you one thing. I want you to really think. Think about this world and all that it has to offer. Think about the life that you live now. Think about these messages that Brother Gio has been preaching about our sacrifices, about, about looking at, 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 the, at the way we do things. And remember... The devil don't care nothing about us. But if he's bothering you, that's a good thing. Because just like I said a while ago, when my grandma couldn't remember my name, if the devil can't remember your name, you might ought to be a little bit scared. If he can't remember who you are, you might ought to hit your knees. I want him to know who I am. He said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? I want the devil to know who I am. But at the same time, I never want to forget who God is.
and what he's done for me. You see, God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He said, lo, I'll be with you always, Brother Leonard, even until the end of the world. A lot of, a lot of people I told, and I let them know, I said, one day, we're all going to stand before the Lord. And they said, well, I'm ready. I said, well, that's good. They said, Bo, I don't believe you have to do all that. And I would try to explain to them. I said, you know, from the beginning of time, God made Adam and Eve. He gave them a rule. He said, don't touch of this tree. Don't eat of this tree, because the day you do, you'll surely die. I said, when he gave the message to Noah, he had a plan. If Noah didn't follow that plan like he was supposed to, we wouldn't have heard the story of Noah. He'd been right there with the rest of them. It had been all over with. I said, and that same God said he changes not. I said, he set into motion a plan. And if we don't follow that plan exactly the way he laid it out, we're going to be lost. And they looked at me and they said, well, you might be right. I said, God, whatever it takes, you got to help us to do the best we can do. Help us, O oh Lord, that when we stand before you, because if the devil don't know you now, will God know you on the day of judgment? Or will he say unto us, depart from me, because I never knew you? You see, that's the thought that goes through my mind. Depart from me, for I never knew you. I never want to hear that. I never want to hear that. I never want any of you under the sound of my voice to hear that. But what I want, what I want to do, I remember me and Brother Doyle a long time ago. You might have forgot this, Brother Doyle. But Brother Doyle owes me a fishing trip on the other side. That's what he told me. He said, Brother Larry, he said, if they got fishing over there, me and you going fishing. I said, I'll be right there with you. And I'll never forget that. I was a young'un, but I remember that. I remember a man brother, by the name of Brother Gene Newsom came to me one night, and he had cancer. And he walked up to me in the church, and he said, Hello, my friend. And he shook my hand. And he had these piercing blue eyes, didn't he, Brother Robbie? They just looked right through you, pretty eyes. And he shook my hand and he said, would you do me a favor? And I said, sir, I don't, can't make a promise till I know exactly what you're talking about. He said, will you be a pallbearer at my funeral? And when he said that to me, it, it, it took me back because I didn't know what to say. And he said, will you? I said, yes, sir, I'd be honored to. And I went to see him. Right before he died, he couldn't speak. And he was laying there in the bed, and I walked in, and I held his hand. And he was looking up into the heavens, and somebody knelt down in his ear. And he said, hey, your buddy here is here, little Larry. And he rolled over, and he smiled. And I knelt down, and I gave him a hug, and I told him I loved him. And I made a promise to him. And I thought of this promise every day that I was doing what I shouldn't supposed to have been doing. And I told him, I said, I'll see you again, brother. I'll see you again. And I meant that. But circumstances arise that each and every one of us face. Things happen in our life, and we think we can't get out of it. But I'm here to tell you, if we just give it to the Lord, that all things will work together. All things will work together. If we just give it to him and trust in him and believe in him. I know this has been a, a little unorthodox tonight, but it's really been, been weighing heavy on my heart that some people look to somebody that don't even care about them. I had friends in this world, Marcus. They run around. They've done a lot of things. They don't mean to be bad. Most of them don't. They're good people. They're serving somebody that don't even care about them, Sister Nadine, that don't even love them. But there is a God 
that loves them more than anything. That knelt down in the dirt and formed them and breathed the breath of life into them. That called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. That formed them in their mother's womb and called them. I heard a message by Brother Merle Ewing one time. It's called Early Altars. If you're ever on YouTube, you need to look it up. It's a good one. And it talks about, Brother Pete, these children being called to the Lord from a young age like Samuel was. And how dreams would begin to happen in their mind. And they would, they would see themselves on a missions field somewhere. And they would forget about it until they was teenagers or something. Then they begin to realize that God was calling them all of their life. One of my favorite scriptures is the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and the Lord delighteth in his way. I want the Lord to delight in my way. I want him to look at me and say, I'm proud of you. Good job. I love you. I know he loves me. There's no doubt in my mind. I know my mom and daddy love me. But there's nothing greater in this world than to have somebody put their arm around you and let you know how proud of you they are. And you see, ain't nobody can do that like Jesus can. Nobody can love you like Jesus can. He's the author and the finisher of my faith, and I love him tonight. Let's stand and worship the Lord. And just, just take